Hi, everybody. My name is uh, David Cohen. I'm a reproductive endocrinologist in Chicago at the Institute for Human Reproduction. It's a little unusual for me, I have to say. I've never done this before. I've given talks all over the world, but I've never actually given a Zoom talk to so many people. Um, and it really is hard to follow that culinary expertise of somebody I really adore. Her cooking was unbelievable, but I will try. And I hope that you guys can learn something from this. My goals are the following. My aims to review some infertility evaluation. Um, I'm gonna try and move this out of the way. To teach you guys how eggs, oocytes are obtained and fertilized to re review some normal embryology through uh, day five or six after fertilization. The reason this is important is because that's when we do biopsies. And ultimately what we're gonna be after here is trying to create a normal embryo that would, when transferred into a person, would uh, into a woman that would lead to a pregnancy, right? Um, and in order to do that, you have to biopsy, which is just a nice way of saying sample, the trophectoderm, which is the tissue around the embryo, which is embryonic in origin but it's, it is the embryo. Some basic definitions. Infertility is the inability to conceive after one year of unprotected intercourse. Straightforward, simple. There is a nuance. This, this diagnosis for one year, by the way, this definition comes from the World Health Organization and it comes from the fact that say a typical 30 year old woman in a given month has about a 15, 1-5% chance of not only conceiving in that month, but going on and carrying to a live birth which is the only number anybody really cares about. If you get pregnant and miscarry, you have a tubal pregnancy, eh, nobody cares. It's nice, but it's not a success, right? So that's considered failure. So a success is relatively low in humans. Human biology has about, a, for a 30-year-old woman, about a 15% chance per month. For 40, it's about 10%. At 20, 18, 20 years old, it's around 20 to 25%. So even at the best of times, there's a built-in 75% chance of failure. And one has to keep that in mind. Um, and worldwide, uh, the World Health Organization had to come up with some definition that everybody could agree on. In the United States, we have to be a little bit different in the Western countries, but it started here. Uh, in women who are over 35, who clearly have a lower chance of success, there's a, a sort of a sub-diagnosis, a sub-definition of six months of trauma. Fertility itself is the ability to conceive. Fecundity, which is a word we're not gonna use that much, uh, is the ability to carry a pregnancy, but it's just as important, right? The goal for me is not to get a patient pregnant, not to get anybody pregnant. The goal is to get her a healthy live birth, right? Because it's easy to get caught up in this desire to just get pregnant, especially you're waiting for that positive pregnancy test. But for me, success is a live birth of a healthy baby. Some basic fundamentals, normally, Sperm are in, I don't know if you guys can see my, I don't have a, a marker anymore. So you can't see me moving around, but um, normally egg and sp uh, the sperm are deposited with intercourse, of course, in the vagina. It's their job to swim up into the uterus, out through the tube and meet the egg in the very distal part of the tube. In this picture on the far left near day zero is the distal part of the tube with all the little fingers that you can see, they're called fimbria. And those fimbria pick up the egg from the ovary below it, and the egg hangs out. It doesn't swim. Remember, the sperm are the ones who have to swim. The, the sperm run down there, swim down there, meet the egg, and then this new thing called an embryo becomes two cells, four cells, eight cells, et cetera, and that process takes approximately five days. And over the course of that five days, it's making its way backwards through the tube, to get into the uterus. All of this is critical because we're gonna mimic it later on when I show you how we do things in the laboratory, but you need to sort of keep this in mind. This is normal biology. This is what's supposed to happen when, when a couple have intercourse and trying to get pregnant or not trying to get pregnant. Um, this is what happens regardless. The embryo then enters into the cavity of the uterus. It spends about four or five days trying to implant and being completing that implantation process until it's completely sort of enveloped by the lining of the uterus and becomes a part essentially of the mom. What are some, some statistics? There's no way to hide from this. I'm not a big fan of statistics because it drives me crazy, but it sort of helps people understand that they're not alone. 
Um, and I think that's really critical for everybody, regardless of what the reason to coming to it, somebody like me is, is about. About 80% of couples will conceive within uh, one year of unprotected intercourse. So that's good news, right? About 86% will conceive within two years. Ultimately, there's a group of people that don't conceive, right? So 14 to 20% of US couples reach the definition of infertility. And that's important because it means they might need help. What are the usual reasons in general? It's about a third, a third, a third. Uh, about 40-ish percent, maybe a little bit less, are just a female factor. The classic example, her tubes are blocked. Fine. So now the egg and sperm won't get together, right? If the egg is at the end of the tube and the sperm has to meet it, well, clearly they're not going to get together if you block the tube. And if you block both of them, game over. About a third, about 30-ish percent, will have a male factor. Um, and that just means that there's an inadequate quality or quantity of sperm. So you can have um, tons and tons of sperm, but they're all dead. They don't move or they all appear and look grossly abnormal and they therefore don't lead to a normal fertilization. So this is a combination of issues that can lead to this abnormality. Uh, particularly, we're gonna talk about this in a second uh, in the Fanconi population. Uh, this is a problem amongst males. And then of course, there's the group in which both the male and the female have a problem of some sort it's my job to figure out what's going on and try to cast a large net when I'm in this diagnostic process to figure out where the problems are. If you think of this whole thing as a stool, there's three legs. There's the egg, there's the egg factor, the tube factor, and the sperm. Done, right? So I have to look at it all. It's really not nuclear physics. I just have to make sure I don't miss it. Looking at this another way, the same sort of statistics, just because, I don't know, I like fractions as opposed to percents percents always make me feel like somebody is lying to me. So one in seven couples uh, will have infertility when the woman is between 30 and 34. One in five, if she's older by another, you know, the next five years and one in four uh, in the following five years. This is just obvious. If the probability of the egg giving us a normal number of chromosomes, which are little packages of DNA, which I'll show you a cool picture of in a second. Um, if the probability of that happening decreases with age, the fidelity of the egg dividing equally into two daughter cells so that the sperm can come along and get a normal egg decreases with the woman's age. And just for those who are wondering, it decreases with men as well. The difference is it happens a couple of decades later. So if you take a male sperm from a 70 or 80 year old gentleman, you'll find that the probability that he could have a baby, for example, with Downs or some other genetic abnormality or miscarriages from genetic abnormalities is higher. Obviously, it's not as much of a problem because there aren't as many older men trying to have babies, but if you look in history, you find this. Miscarriage is an other issue as a, a typical age woman has about a 10 to 15% chance uh, in that younger age group of having a pregnancy that leads to a miscarriage which is a very high number if you think about it. And it climbs very high to, to approximately 34% after a woman is 40. This is just normal people. So sperm problems, anovulation or oligoovulation or no ovulation, meaning the, the eggs don't come out once a month or if she doesn't have an ovulated egg um, even once every three months or four months, it's just random or not at all. That's what that second category is, tubal disease I touched on. Unexplained is a big problem because we can't find the answer. In typical couples, somewhere around 40 to 50% find nothing wrong. I'm always faced with this dilemma of people saying, what do you mean, doc? I've been trying forever and ever. We just went through like a whole month of testing or whatever it's been, six weeks of testing, and you found nothing? Like either you're a crappy doctor or you don't have the right test. I need another test. I went online, I found another test. The problem is we don't have a test for every facet of this problem. And so we are left with a category, much like we do in many, many other um, disease states, by the way, in which we have to declare and be honest and say, we honestly don't know. That does not mean that we don't have a treatment for it. It doesn't mean that we can't address it. And indeed, sometimes it's actually better to have unexplained. As gnawing as it is on our consciousness, 
that we don't have an answer, which drives me crazy, I admit, and certainly drives a lot of patients crazy, sometimes not having a specific explanation is better. For example, if you have a specific explanation that, the, that there is zero sperm, you pretty much kind of have to go to uh, a sperm donor, right? If you can't even get sperm from a biopsy of a testicle. People don't want to hear that, and it's very painful. And so I would rather put somebody in the unexplained category and at least know that I have a chance than a distinct explanation that has potentially no intervention that I can offer them. CX stands for cervical factors. The cervix is the lower part of the uterus. I like to think of the uterus a little bit like a light bulb. So there's a narrow part and it opens to a top part, just like a classic light bulb, not the funky new light bulbs, the old fashioned light bulbs. And that bottom part is really critical. It's what makes all that mucus that we talk about. And it's what allows the sperm to, to make their way from the vagina up into the uterus and then ultimately down through the tubes to find the egg. If it's damaged, and the classic example is people who have had uh, abnormal pap smears and then treatments like biopsies and um, large segments of this part of the uterus removed, um, then they have a problem getting egg and sperm together. We can overcome it, but absolutely this is a problem. In the Fanconi population, just as an aside, there is an increased risk of something called squamous cell cancers. These are cancers of the lining of the uterus, for example, the lining of the cervix. The, the, it's a type of cell um, that is not the same kind of cell that makes mucus, but it's the same kind of cell that sort of protects the surfaces. We have squamous cell on our skin and we have squamous cell inside the vagina. And when the overwhelming majority of abnormal pap smears arises, it's usually of a squamous cell type there are others, but that's the most common. And this is clearly a problem in the, in the uh, population of individuals with, with Fanconi specifically. Lastly, peritoneal factors. The peritoneum is that cavity where your stomach is, your intestines, your appendix, your uterus, your ovaries, uh, et cetera. If somebody has endometriosis, where they have the lining of their uterus elsewhere, the most common place for that is inside the peritoneum, leads to lots of sticking together of these tissues, and that can lead to blockage of, of tubes, for example. People who have had an infection, just typical sexually transmitted uh, things that happen to everybody, like chlamydia, gonorrhea, um, can lead to infections inside, inside the abdomen in that peritoneal space, and that would preclude or make it very difficult for egg and sperm to get together. Just as an aside, I'm wondering if everybody's still listening because I can't see you guys, which is just a little bit weird. So if somebody could tell me that they're still awake, I would appreciate it. If you want to scream or say hi or whoever that guy was helping me before, that'd be cool. Associated factors. So PID is infections, like I mentioned. We're here and it looks great, David. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Uh, PID, endometriosis, I measured. Ovarian aging. I'm going to talk to you about that a little bit more because it is a specific problem in the Fanconi population in which the aging of the ovaries is a little accelerated compared to, um, compared to the general population. Everything always gets compared to the general population. So for example, the average person, woman, goes through menopause at 51.7 years old. Don't ask me why I know these useless numbers. Um, I have a lot of useless information stuck in my head, but that is a fact. It's about 51.7 years old. So that means plus or minus two standard deviations. So some people can keep having periods until they're close to 60. It's just very rare. The average age for Fanconi is clearly, uh, women, is clearly younger. Spermatic varicocele, this is in men, of course, uh, in which there is a, a large collection of veins. This doesn't happen to uh, any higher population, any, any more in this population than any other. And whether or not it's truly associated with infertility is still up for grabs. Um, some people say it is, some people say it isn't. Whether or not you should fix it um, is debatable, but I leave it on the list because it's constantly talked about by urologists and um, certainly men who have a symptomatic one. So not, not, not so much infertility, but it's causing pain should have it removed. Toxins, this is obvious if you work in an area where you could be exposed to weird chemicals, whether it's a chemical plant or a nuclear plant or just a paint store or something that you're constantly breathing things like this in can lead to damage to both eggs or sp and sperm. Previous abdominal surgery, that's in the peritoneal cavity section uh, in which the scarring, for example, after a ruptured appendix, which is really common, right? Uh, somebody could have a lot of 
damage that's been done in their, in their pelvis. The interesting area here, I think, actually, is people who have had infections in their peritoneum but didn't even know. And the classic example is um, things like bowel perforations that they, they, yeah, they felt terrible for a couple of weeks, but it got better. And then they didn't think about it. Then that happened when they were 18 or something. And now they're 28 and they want to have a baby and eh, something's wrong. And their tubes seem to be damaged from that previous infection. Cervical and uterine abnormalities. I talked about this previously. Same thing with surgeries. This is procedures in which you take out a segment of tissue that you think is at risk of cancer, for example. And fibroids, these are, um, these are tumors of the uterus that in general don't usually cause uh, infertility. They tend to cause problems with, um, with carrying a pregnancy. Uh, and they are monoclonal, meaning they, arrive, they derive from a single cell that's gone berserk and grows into anything from the size of a marble to the size of a watermelon and can obviously distort the normal uterus um, and cause problems with allowing for space for the baby to grow or, yes, for egg and sperm to get together. Some si simple things that you should always keep in mind because this is really, really, really hard. You know, people refer to the process of infertility and managing it as a roller coaster of emotions. I, I don't particularly ascribe to that um, that analogy. I prefer the one of the of the guy, the couple, or whatever in a boat. If you're on a boat in the middle of the ocean and you're waiting to hopefully drift into the lanes where the boats go and the boat picks you up, and we'll call that success, you feel a little bit like, oh my God, is that boat ever going to show up? And am I ever going to be saved? Am I ever going to get pregnant? The problem I don't, the thing I don't like about the roller coaster analogy is that the truth is, once you get on the roller coaster, you realize you made a big mistake and you're throwing up and it's miserable. But the truth is, you know when it's going to end. And that's the issue. You know that unless the little kid at the end doesn't pull the stop and makes you go around a second time, you're getting off. You made a mistake, you're getting off. Not so here. Here, you don't know when you're getting off. You're just sort of hoping that the next step works. And it's very, you know, leads to frustration and anger. And much like this sort of population where, where this organization, a population group, um, organization where you guys are helping each other, right? Lord knows I, I could watch you guys teaching me how to cook all day long, but just all the other things you do for each other. This is just another subset of area that demands people to hold each other's hands. It just does. The history is important. Uh, both of the couple should be there, the male and the female, if it's two, if it's two women, they should be there, if they're two men, I, I don't actually care. But I think if somebody's trying to have a baby with somebody else, they should be there together. Obviously their ages are critical and previous pregnancies that each has, has, has or hasn't had. Uh, the length of time, as we mentioned, and dependent on, on the age of the couple should be investigated. And then of course, all the sexual history. It's obvious if they're not having intercourse very often, uh, for whatever reason, that it needs to be addressed. For example, I have a lot of patients who have uh, erectile dysfunction in, in, the, in the couples, but there's no problem getting a sample in a masturbated sample. And so we can introduce the sperm into her through an in insemination, which is just a nice way of saying, take the sperm and put it inside the uterus. They still have to swim down this tube, find the egg, get to know her, bring her back five days later, da da da, as an embryo but it's a relatively simple thing to fix. But if the discussion about that problem hasn't been addressed, you could waste months. On the male side, history of infection, I've mentioned this, toxins and radiation, mumps is another viral disease. We're all talking about viruses these days. Um, that is devastating. Mumps in a child can lead to lifelong infertility. Testicular surgery from injury, the most common thing is just damage from like a baseball or football um, injuries or people straddle injuries from playing in the park, et cetera. In women, previous surgery, infections, appendicitis, I mentioned endometriosis, ectopic pregnancy. DES doesn't happen very much anymore. This is the last women that got DES was pretty much in the seventies. And the issue there is that it leads to abnormalities in, women, in the daughters of the women that took it. Um, and so we don't have that many people anymore because we stopped using DES uh, in the 70s. One of the most common reasons for infertility is um, 
and ovulation, which is just a nice way of saying the woman doesn't have a period once a month because she doesn't make a mature follicle to be able to ovulate once a month. And just so you get what I'm saying here, you can see that in this picture, which is an ultrasound picture taken through the vagina of these little bracelet-like circles, which are little follicles, each one hopefully carrying a little egg in them, but they're all tiny. You notice that? The eggs are, are, are always um, located on the periphery, on the cortex, the periphery of the ovary. And same is true in this situation. The problem is that once a month, uh, two weeks after the period start, one of those is supposed to grow to be the dominant follicle. And in PCO type patients, ovaries, that doesn't happen. So they never ovulate. If you don't ovulate, or they ovulate um, unpredictably, if you don't ovulate regularly or predictably or both, then the ovary will never make progesterone. Progesterone, the word itself gives it away. Pro, like I'm in favor of everybody should eat cotton candy. Pro, P-R-O. Gestation means pregnancy. So the hormone itself tells you what it does. It prepares the lining of the uterus to be ready for that embryo, should one come along five days later, to implant in it. And so it's not possible to get pregnant if you don't ovulate and have an egg there in the first place for the sperm to find, and if you don't make progesterone to prepare the lining of the uterus. So that's what this picture is there to remind me to tell you. The number of eggs changes through life. So the lower curve, the one that says oocytes, is the one that I want you to focus on. It shows you that around 12 weeks of gestation, when, you, when that woman, that baby is still inside her mother, she starts making eggs. And it peaks somewhere around 24 weeks of gestation, about, about uh, a, a couple months later, three months later. But then it continually decreases such that at birth, there's about 2 million of them, right? And then by puberty, you're already down. So that's like, what, 13, 12 years old? You're already down to uh, under a million. Now, you should ovulate. A typical woman should ovulate about 300 eggs in a lifetime. So there's plenty of eggs but you can see that it's of the number that you started with is a teeny fraction. The same is not true for men. Men are constantly making new sperm. Um, it takes about 72 days to make a sperm. Um, and throughout life, barring any medical issues, the, the, most men make sperm forever. Specific issues for infertility in patients with, with uh, Fanconi. These people tend to have lower AMHs, guys. So what's an AMH? AMH is made by those little cells that surround the egg called the granulosa cells. Everybody makes it, men make it too, but if it's low, it implies that the number of follicles, the number of eggs that are available to be in, 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 ovulated is less. Nice way of saying that is insufficient. It's also true, as I alluded to earlier, that the semen analysis of men um, tends to be worse, tends to have um, lower counts, which is the number of sperm per unit volume, milliliter, and that the fraction that are motile and or look normal, have no morphology, which is just shape and things, are, are, are lower. There is an increased risk of carrying problems as well, including things like preeclampsia and miscarriage, and ultimately of cesarean section delivery, which has its own morbidity that you cannot um, ignore. You'll notice that I put genital tract cancers, no question about it. In, 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 um, in individuals with Fanconi, there's a higher incidence of these squamous cell cancers, uh, the lining of the, of the vagina, the lining on the cervix, and therefore one has to be, one, the physicians have to be aware to look for it. There's also a higher chance of abnormal vaginal bleeding from menstrual disorders, and this is associated with something I'm sure you guys are all well aware of because of platelet abnormalities or platelet dysfunction or lack of number of platelets, correct numbers of platelets, all three of those would lead to uh, potentially abnormal amounts of bleeding. Just needs to be aware of it. People sometimes need platelet transfusions if they're lower. And lastly, there's no question that as people get stem cell transplants, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with, you can have secondary problems not unlike what I'm talking about with a low platelet issue, but also of other secondary cancers. And so all of this plays into the concerns over how you're going to help somebody get pregnant. Here's a picture of, remember I told you the periphery of the ovary is where you find the eggs. So this is the periphery of the ovary. Uh, in 
what it looks like under a microscope. And you can see there's three little circles there on the right side of the screen. The far left side of the screen is where is the edge of the, of the ovary. Far, far to the right, you can start to see that light pink, that's the blood vessels. But what you clearly see is that there's only three little follicles. This is essentially what happens when the ovary is failing. So this, if you took a look at this in a typical 80 year old woman, you would say, yeah, she's menopausal. But if you had the same sampling from a 30 year old woman, you would say, this is a problem. And um, we may not have any eggs there to even stimulate to get out, to try to fertilize. This is just, um, actually I should have put it backwards, but anyway, I think you can still read it, that of what happens with age in normal individuals. It goes down, AMH levels goes down, such that by the time somebody's around 40, you expect it to be around 1.0. Most people are trying to get pregnant in their 20s and 30s, and so it should be around three. In Fanconi patients, we tend to see it half that, so two or less. Um, that doesn't mean there aren't any eggs, there certainly are, and, and that's fine. It just means that our sense of urgency to go get them is higher. Remember I told you I was gonna show you a cool picture of the genetics of what actually happens. So I don't want you to perseverate on this picture too much, but just know that on the left where it says meiosis at the top left there, you can see that what's really going on is that there's a blue and a red chromosome and each one has two strands. The blue comes from the mom and the red comes from the, the, the excuse me, the blue comes from the dad and the red comes from the mom, although pick your poison, it doesn't matter to me. And there's a two cell divisions, right? In green, you see cell division one, cell division two. And at the end of the day, what's supposed to happen is that each of those little circles is supposed to have 23 chromosomes. The same thing is happening in both uh, male, excuse me, and female. And so each one gives 23 chromosomes and that means the baby would end up with 46, which is a normal number. As I said, that separation process, this business that you see that looks like a spindle that's separating the second to last line, this, the fidelity of this fails as a woman ages so that let's say uh, both blues end up on the left-hand side, you would end up with one red, one red with that little bit of blue, two blues and nothing in the third one, right? So imagine that the egg is the third one with the two blues, along comes 23, which is just one blue uh, from, the, from the partner, from a sperm, you would have three that would be like Downs or other diseases in that category where there's too many chromosomes. I told you about uh, men. This is just a paper that came from not that long ago from genetics and medicine in 2018. A lot of authors, which I kind of like, it means that people are interested in this uh, area of medicine. So it describes um, a specific type of mutation in Fanconi that uh, allows for or causes male factor infertility. Actually, interestingly, they, they take this um, and they looked for this because they had found it in, in mice. And so then they looked for it in populations of people. And sure enough, in the FAN, which is uh, associated with Fran Franconi's uh, gene, they found the, this mutation specifically in a family, I believe they were from, uh, from Pakistan. What are some tests to find out if somebody actually is ovulating? You can measure their progesterone. If you measure it after ovulation, which is like in the third or fourth week of their cycle, it should be elevated. The classic example is over 15 nanograms per milliliter. But if it's over 10, she ovulated. If it's still one, probably not. Urine LH kits. These are kits that people pee on every day. I'm sure you guys have tried this. Somebody probably in the audience has to figure out when's the best time to have intercourse. Well, it predicts when you're gonna ovulate, which is really helpful, right? The last test I showed you is after the fact. So yeah, you prove the person, it's like a temperature chart after, it'll go up after the person ovulates, which is great, you prove that they ovulated. But if you wanna get egg and sperm together and you wanna optimize this process, you would try to use a urine LH kit. And you can buy these cheap over the counter at you know CVS or Walgreens or whatever. X-rays to confirm whether or not the, tube, the tubes are, are uh, open is critical. And you can inject some dye at the bottom there. You see the white, which is the dye that's going in. This is an X-ray. Um, it's been labeled. It's a little grainy because I blew it up. But 
it's correct. And you can see the sort of triangular shaped uterus at the top there with these lines um, that are associated with the um, tubes. And you see a lot of spillage on both sides, which allows for um, uh, confirmation that the tubes are opened. <clears throat> In this slide, you can see that one egg out of a group every month is supposed to be selected, and I mentioned this when I talked about polycystic ovaries, is supposed to be selected as the DF, the dominant follicle. So a handful of follicles are recruited, that's what you see at the top left, and then over time, days of menstrual cycle, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, et cetera, one of them gets selected to be the dominant follicle, which is the one that would theoretically ovulate and make itself available to be fertilized at the very end of the tube. The other ones are lost. Atresia is a nice way of saying gone, lost. <clears throat> so each month you ovulate, say one egg, but you lose maybe 10. Some basic endocrinology. We can manipulate this process, that the curve on the right that you see with that same you know, dominant follicle and atresia thing, we can manipulate it by adding this, the bright red line is giving people FSH. You'll see right below that line, it says FSH, follicle stimulating hormone. You can give that in the form of injections. It doesn't come in the form of a pill. And you can say to the ovaries through this pill, through this injection, hey, make more follicles. And if you look at the ultrasound picture on the right, you see lots of little circles, tons of them, and they're pretty big. Those are follicles that have responded to the shots. And the goal here is to get as many eggs as you possibly can in advance of fertilizing them with sperm. Here's just another picture of the same idea. Um, and you can see the circle at the very top um, of the sort of triangular shaped image is where the vagina is. And the pictures, you can see the ovary with um, lots of black circles within it. Each black circle represents a follicle. And I didn't have a real picture of this, so I took it from Netter. And you can see this is how we actually get the eggs. So it's not like the needle that we have is, is a harpoon that's really long. People have this image in their head of some craziness where it goes up through the uterus, out through the tube, and then to the ovary. No. Once you make the follicles big and those circles that the needle is in, for example, those are those black circles we saw on the ultrasound. And you can see with the ultrasound in the vagina, where the, that's an ultrasound holding a needle right now, you can see them really close up, very close to the... Um, the vaginal wall. And if you put a needle through the vaginal wall, you can um, remove, if that needle is hooked up to a vacuum, the eggs that are inside. So you suck out the fluid that's in there and hope you see the little dot where the, the egg is supposed to be represented gets pulled into the needle as well. And we can get it at the other side. Is everybody with me? I have no idea. So now we're going to talk about what to do with that egg once you get it. If you look on the top left, you'll see that there's a little teeny thing that has a tail on it. That's a sperm. And just to put this in perspective, the thing on the top right picture um, is the egg. So look at the difference. It's huge. The egg is massive, just for a proportional sense of difference here. And if you look at the little needle that's coming in from the far right and the top right picture, you can see that little sperm that's now inside the glass uh, needle, inside at the very tip. Does everybody see that? And as the needle gets pushed into the egg, you start to see the envelope of the egg tent. It tents towards the left, and that's because it has a very strong tensile strength. The needle is being pushed with a teeny, teeny uh, instrument that as it goes further and further and further, it finally pokes through. It's as if it's going through um, saran wrap, and then eventually you push hard enough and it's very, very sharp. It'll poke through and you can drop the egg off, excuse me, drop the sperm off inside the egg. Here's just another picture looking at it coming from the other side. And you see that envelope being tented, that, that layer of saran wrap, as I sort of called it, um, being pushed. And then up close. When you first take the egg out of uh, a woman, it looks like a big blob on the far left and the top, and it's got lots of cells around it, and it's kind of hard to tell whether it's mature or not mature. It's just a very obvious circle. It looks a little bit like you're looking at Mars from 4,000, 4 billion miles away. 
the egg that you use for ICSI, which is in the next screen uh, on, on the top middle, has obviously been cleaned up. And you can see that um, it is a mature looking, clean, beautiful egg. Once you add sperm to it, like you just saw in the previous picture, there's two nuclei, one nucleus from the egg and one nucleus from the sperm that are then what are called 2PN, pronuclei embryos. It just tells you in that far upper right picture that that egg was fertilized. Um, and then those cells will become one, then become two. A few days later, it'll be four cells in the bottom left, eight cells, and finally a blastocyst five days later. This is what it looks like when it enters into the uterus. Again, I'm bringing back this picture just to remind you, look at the top where it says blastocyst right over the uterus there. That's five days or 120 or so hours after we put egg and sperm together. I wanted to take, show you a little bit about, if you look at this picture, this is a live, hopefully you can see it, a biopsy of that thing. So let's say you're at risk for Fanconi, right? So a couple both have mutation, let's say, and you're trying to maybe prevent Fanconi. Or a couple with Fanconi are at risk for some other disease, like say cystic fibrosis, and you want to test the embryo to try to prevent the transmission of that disease into the embryo. Select the embryo, uh, let's say without it. So you can see that under pressure here, the cells are about to pull away and into the thing, right? And if you <clears throat> now look at this embryo, and there's the sample, that little sample that was over there on the left can be sent to a lab and they can tell you what the genetics of this embryo is. So if you label this embryo as embryo number one, for example, and let's say you have five embryos to biopsy, you have one, two, three, four, five, you can say one, one prime, two prime, three prime are the biopsy samples and have corresponding ones. Um, here's another one of a biopsy just to show you and you can see the little red dot in the middle of the screen and you have to just bear with me, it goes a little bit slowly. Hopefully this is working for you. Somebody tell me it's working. There's pulling coming from the pipette on the far right, and it's pulling just a couple of cells. But in order to nudge them along a little bit, that little red dot is actually a laser beam that can be used to separate cells by cutting them, but not the cells, the space between them. And there, zap, zap, right there, you see that? And there's suction being pulled through the pipette in order to pull a couple of these cells off of the embryo. The rest of the embryo that's on the left side will be frozen while that sample that's now being pulled into the pipette, then there it goes, will be sent to be tested. So this is embryo number two and that's sample number two A, let's say, okay? Fascinating, at least it is to me. And I've been doing this a long time, so I'm really excited every time I see this because it's super cool that you can do this. Um, Next picture. So who could benefit from this? Specifically from um, HLA matching. So you may know, uh, I'm sure you probably do, that um, it's even possible to try to treat, I, I'm reticent to use the word cure, but cure uh, Fanconi if you can transfuse uh, a child very early, early on. Um, you can, if you have uh, stem cells from a HLA matched donor, usually this is gonna be from the same parents who um, can match the HLA, which is the tissue typing, much like you know, transfusing blood from one person into another, we obviously have to have the same blood type in order for that to be safe. The same is true for tissue typing. It's a little more complicated, but it's the same concept. You wouldn't transfer blood of somebody A into somebody who's a, uh, from somebody who has a blood type B, and in the same way, HLA must be compatible between the donor and the recipient. And not all siblings are necessarily compatible. That's why if you get an embryo in the lab, you can test it by biopsying it like I just showed you to see whether or not it contains um, compatibility to the affected child with, with anemia. So uh, then that child will grow up the, the, uh, through pregnancy, deliver would presumably be healthy, hopefully. And one can take the blood from the placenta, it's not from the baby, but from the placenta and the cord, which is attached, of course, um, clean it, prepare it, use the stem cells from it to transfuse into the older sibling, who might be now, let's say, two years old, um, and 
uh, treat this treat the sibling. And with that, I just wanted to say thank you to everybody. Um, I'm I'm very proud to to be asked to be involved with this group. Just so you know, um, I find the sophistication of the presentations that I've had the pleasure of being involved with for the last two years um, to be an honor to be a part of. Uh, and I just wanted to say thank you to everybody, specifically the organizers. Uh, there's a one patient out there who some of you may know that um, that is very close to my heart and I have the greatest wishes for, but anybody who has questions for me, please, it uh, doesn't cost you anything to pick up the phone and we can talk. And if you have some questions, I might, if you're, I don't know where you are in this world, but I probably know somebody close by that might be able to help you um, to a referral center, et cetera. And I'm happy to make that phone call uh, on a very personal level. I, I mean that sincerely. So with that, I just wanted to say thank you. Bye everybody. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. That was super informative and we're just so glad to have you be a part of this community and working with our uh, Fanconi My patients. Pleasure. Um, so I do want to open it up for just a couple minutes of Q&A. We do have, do I have one. to do anything or push anything or just talk? Nope. You just talk. You just answer okay. the questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, we have a question from Jack and he says, if using IVF, would it be wiser slash more cost effective to have our partner carrier tested first or go straight into PGD to see what happens? Um, well, I think you're talking about PGT for the specific, for Franconi, is that correct? And if you are both, it's autosomal recessive. So both uh, the egg and the sperm have to carry the abnormality. So you answered your own question, both should be tested beforehand. In fact, just knowing that the two are, are carriers isn't enough. You need to characterize each mutation. Uh, and get very specific. That process can take about six weeks once you have the, the mom's and the dad's blood to confirm because you need to, to um, very specifically not only know that the embryo has been tested correctly because you have to trust the results, you have to know not just the Fanconi uh, mutation that you're dealing with, but also to be sure that local areas near that mutation in the DNA are matched. So both, the answer is both. So you should not just go right ahead and, and do just a PGD blindly. No, no, no lab would do that for you. Great, thank you so much for asking or answering that. Um, we have another question. Is there any medication process or lifestyle change men can do to increase sperm health? Oh, I love that question. That's a good one. Um, and the reason I like it is because nobody ever thinks about the guys. I try to constantly bring them up, but CoQ10, vitamin CoQ10 has been shown to be very helpful in everybody um, for lots of reasons, but specifically for sperm. So obviously you should start with a simple sperm analysis. If, if the sperm are fine, they're fine, you're done. Um, but if they aren't, then uh, two things should happen. I'm a big fan of freezing sperm because if they're on their way down in the process, I don't want to come back three months later or two months later and find out there's no sperm left and we just missed them all. So I like freezing. It's the bird in the hand argument. And I like to, um, where, to tell people to take vitamin CoQ10. It's 200 milligrams twice a day and easy to find. You buy it at a vitamin store, CVS, Walgreens, whatever. I think it's important to, um, I know this sounds silly, but not wear tight underwear, not spend hours and hours and hours in a hot tub. Uh, temperature is very important for spermatogenesis, the production of normal sperm. I think it's obvious that the biggest problem is smoking, including smoking weed, because uh, not so much of the marijuana drug itself, but because uh, of the hypoxia, the lack of oxygen that the guy is getting. So, you know, it, 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 but smoking's got to stop. Um, alcohol, not good for you, but doesn't seem to cause that much problem, obviously in moderation. Um, uh, so that pretty much sums it up. Vitamins, um, lifestyle, of course, losing weight is always a good thing, uh, eating healthy, but that's sort of just obvious. And then um, not inhaling anything. 
Great, thank you so much. Sure. Uh, we have another question. Um, she just says, thank you so much, doctor. Um, have you had more experience with FA patients who have used their own eggs to conceive or those who have used a donor? And then she said, I am someone who will need to do the latter. I'm wondering about the success rates and what might be different in this situation, processes, risks, et cetera. I think it's probably 50-50 for me. Um, it's not like I have had 500 patients with FA, with FA that I've taken care of. I, I have not. I'm not sure anybody has. Um, but uh, if you're going to use a donor, then the, then the chance of success, if the uterus is okay, and I, and I use, I say that strongly because it's the other half of the equation is the uterus, right? So 50% of it is getting a good embryo, but then 50% is the uterus. If you use a donor and the donor is presumably healthy and young, then the probability that it is genetically normal, whether you test it or not and prove it, is 70% of those blastocysts should be normal. If you transfer a known normal embryo, because you don't have to test it, but if you did and you knew it was normal, into a normal healthy uterus, you have about a 65% chance of getting a live birth. If there's a problem with the uterus, then that drops dramatically. So the key here, is to make sure that the uterus is okay. And for me, that's a big deal. There's two areas that I find important. One is something called an HSN, hysterosonogram, where you squirt a little bit of water inside the uterus so you can really sort of inflate the uterus. I don't know if my camera's working anymore, but the uterus is normally like a balloon with the walls touching each other. So you can't see inside of it unless you put some water and you can see inside of it with ultrasound. It's not a fun test, but it's not horrible. Um, it takes about five minutes. Um, and in a small group of people, there's a test called uh, ERA, E-R-A, in which you can assess the lining of the uterus at a molecular level. This is more expensive. Um, if there's a lot of embryos, which there tends to be when you use a donor, then I usually don't tell people to do ERA right away. I'll frequently say, well, we can try once first, and if it doesn't work, then let's do ERA. The ERA test helps you understand how many days of progesterone that given woman should need for successful implantation. Uh, as I told you, most people get five days of progesterone because we're mimicking what mother nature does. So 75% of women just looking at them across the room need five days. But if that woman is, needs six days, the one that you, know, you for example, uh, well, there's no way for us to know that unless you do that era testing. So um, I think in general, if you have a donor, your success rate should be excellent. Um, assuming all other things equal that, you know, your general health is good and et cetera. There's no major problems with the uterus. That's it. Thank you. And uh, she followed that up with, what was the name of the water inflating test? Oh, everybody calls it something different. In my office, we call it HSN, HSN Harry, Sam, Nancy. Hystero, hystero means uterus, sono, sonogram, uh, hysterosonogram. Uh, some people call it SIS, sono installation saline or something, I don't know. And then some people call it uh, SHG, sono histogram. Uh, I showed you a picture of an HSG, that's with dye, to look at the tubes. So, so you just have to ask your doctor for the same sort of test except with saline or water, in sterile water instead of dye. And there's no x-ray involved. Great. Uh, we have a question that says, would FA males see any benefit from a vasectomy? No. Any benefit in what? Getting pregnant? I'm not sure. That's no, all usually, I mean, if they want to avoid pregnancy, yeah. That's a whole nother lecture, though. You know, you have to come tomorrow <laughs> afternoon when we talk about preventing pregnancy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, and then Mary Beth did just type in to say that she's just typing in here to let you know that you're allowed to use any info from her case if, if that comes in handy. <laughs> oh my God. Now she's going to make me cry. She's an amazing human being, everybody. And um, it, she's proof that perseverance, passion, thoughtfulness can come together in a person who has uh, you know, challenges to get pregnant and can persevere and keep fighting. And for that, I have the utmost respect. So here's a kiss to you. I don't know if you can see me, but I hope to see you soon. They can all see you, it's all good. Oh, okay, because <laughs> I can't see myself. I'm sitting here staring at the, to all organizers and participants, thank you. 
Yeah. All right. Well, I think that about concludes the session. Thank you so much for everything you do for our community. I know they all appreciate it very much. My pleasure. Please, anybody, send me notes or calls or questions. It's, it's, it's really my pleasure to help. Great. Thanks.